and let me now show you the muscular components of the outflow tracts. So the first one to consider is the muscular outlet septum. You've already seen this several times now during the course thus far, and we can define the muscular outlet septum as that septal structure which separates the subaortic from the subpulmonary outlet. And the essence of double outlet right ventricle is that this outlet septum of necessity will be exclusively a right ventricular structure. In the situation of an isolated ventricular septal defect, the outlet septum could be an interventricular structure. But when we have double outlet right ventricle of necessity, it will be a right ventricular structure. The second one we have to consider is the ventricular infundibular fold. And that is any structure which separates the leaflet of an atrioventricular valve from the leaflet of an arterial valve. And of necessity, this is the muscular inner heart curvature. And if the ventricular infundibular fold is effaced, that is the situation in which we attain fibrous continuity between the atrioventricular and arterial valvar leaflets. And then the third crucial structure of the outflow tracts is the septomarginal trabeculation. And as you have now seen many times, this is the muscular structure which reinforces the septal surface of the right ventricle with a body and with anterior and posterior limbs. And in the normal heart, the supraventricular crest inserts between these arms of the septomarginal trabeculation in the hearts we are discussing today, it is the interventricular communication that occupies between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. So let me show you this example that we looked at just a few moments ago of double outlet right ventricle coexisting with tetralogy of fallow and bilateral infundibular structures to identify those various muscle bundles of the outflow tracts. And here you see the septomarginal trabeculation shown with my Y. The limb of the Y is the body of the septomarginal trabeculation. And then you see the anterior limb extending up towards the subpulmonary outflow tract. The posterior limb extending back towards the right atrium and giving rise to the medial papillary muscle. And the ventricular septal defect, or the interventricular communication, is within the arms of the septomarginal trabeculation. The second structure is the muscular outlet septum. And this cut across the outflow tracts shows you beautifully how this muscle structure separates the narrowed subpulmonary infundibulum from that part of the subaortic outflow tract that is connected within the right ventricle. And this immediately shows to you that in the presence of double outlet right ventricle, this outlet septum is exclusively a right ventricular structure. And then the other important structure, which you can see extending through the roof, the superior margin of the ventricular septal defect, and here, shown by the star, we see its cut edge. And this is the muscular inner heart curvature, separating the leaflet of an arterial valve, in this instance the aortic valve, from the leaflet of an atrioventricular valve, the tricuspid valve, and being the inner heart curvature, we name this structure the ventriculo infundibular fold. And they are the three key muscular building blocks that determine the arrangement of double outlet right ventricle. And there are important relationships which give vital information to the surgeon. So the interventricular communication almost always in the setting of double outlet right ventricle is between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. The outlet septum from the surgical stance is a safe structure since it never carries the conduction tissue. And as Andrew has already pointed out, as long as you respect the attachments of the valvar leaflets of the arterial valves to either side of this structure, the outlet septum can safely be resected.
the body of the septomarginal trabeculation is also safe. And this may on occasion produce double chambered right ventricle and that can be resected. But beware of going too deeply within the anterior limb because the septal perforator lurks within this part of the septomarginal trabeculation and damage to the septal perforating artery can produce heart block in certain circumstances. But the major danger area is the posterior limb of the septomarginal trabeculation and the medial papillary muscle because that overlies the branching portion of the atrioventricular conduction axis. But it is the conduction axis itself that is at most risk in relation to the interventricular communication and that is particularly at risk when the defect is perimembranous. And you will remember that we have perimembranous defects when there is continuity between the arterial and atrioventricular valves or in some instances with bilateral infundibular structures when there is fibrous continuity between the tricuspid and the mitral valve. And when the posterior limb of the septomarginal trabeculation fuses with the inner heart curvature, that provides even greater protection to the conduction axis and then the muscular rim, providing it is of substantial proportions, is safe for anchorage of tissues. And then the final structure, the ventricular infundibular folds, separating arterial valves from atrioventricular valves, is safe as far as the conduction tissue goes and can be resected, but the surgeon resecting this area needs to be aware that aggressive resection will take him outside the heart and will put at risk branches of the coronary arteries, but providing everything is sewn up again would not create excessive damage. So within this definition of double outlet right ventricle, we then have many variables. Double outlet right ventricle can exist with any atrial arrangement. It can exist with any form of atrioventricular connections. And it can show varied arterial relationships, as Andrew has already shown you. We have discussed the potential variation in infundibular morphology, and again, as Andrew has emphasized, there can be many associated malformations. But, without question, the most important from the stance of categorization is the interventricular communication. And it was Lev who classified the interventricular defect many years ago in 1972. His system has stood well the passage of time. We can add to Lev's classification intact ventricular septum, which does exist, albeit very rarely. But in essence, Lev pointed out that the defect could be subaortic, subpulmonary, doubly committed, and here we come across the non-committed defect that we discussed this morning. But don't forget that very rarely you can find double outlet with an intact ventricular septum, here in the presence of bilateral infundibular structures. Initially, there was a small ventricular septal defect, but it has closed spontaneously, meaning that there is no direct outlet in this end from the left ventricle. But the most common variants are those first with subaortic defect. And here you see the interventricular defect, and it is walled by the attachment of the outlet septum to the anterior limb, the posterior limb rather, of the septomarginal trabeculation, so that the defect looks into the aorta and into the pulmonary trunk. And then the second commonest variant is that in which the defect is subpulmonary. It is still between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation, so the position of the hole relative to the septum has not changed. The thing that has changed to put the interventricular defect in subpulmonary position is the attachment of the muscular outlet septum because this is now to the midpoint of the ventricular infundibular fold, and it is that attachment to the ventricular infundibular fold that positions the interventricular defect in subpulmonary position. And in these settings with subaortic defect, there are some associated malformations that go hand in hand with the lesion. So typically with the subaortic defect, we have pulmonary stenosis.
and Tetralogy of Fallow with double outlet fits into this subset. In contrast with the subpulmonary defect, it is much more frequent to have coarctation or interruption, since the aorta in this setting retains its infundibular musculature, and also a frequent associated malformation here is straddling and overriding of the mitral valve, and this whole arrangement with subpulmonary defect to my mind, can very conveniently be considered as part of the Tausig-Bing malformation, just as Tetralogy of Fallow fits into the subset of lesions with subaortic defect. And also, since the subpulmonary defect is much closer to discordant ventricular arterial connections, we anticipate finding abnormal arrangements of the coronary arteries.